Splendid. Welcome one and all to the Commit Happy Hour here on Friday the 6th of November at 15.30 hours. Myself Ian, Miss Kimmon and your other hosts Stuart Young will be giving you a bit of a taster of design and manufacturing and uh, assembly this afternoon. Today we are joined by an incredible set of people um, incredible, I say, because they are just amazing. They are the top of their game. We are joined, of course, by uh, Malcolm, Matt, Dave, uh, Sarah and Christine, who are all going to be giving us uh, a bit of an idea about how this is going to potentially revolutionise and change our industry as we know it now and push ourselves into the next decade. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you over to Stuart to give you a few little bits around the background. I'm going to sit back with my gin and tonic. Hopefully you've all got your beer or your gin or your wine or whatever is your tipple for the afternoon. Uh, sit back, relax, enjoy. If you've got any questions, please do fire them through. Over to you, Stuart. Thanks very much, Ian. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, okay, so I want to firstly start and introduce Commit. Um, a lot of new people on the call I noticed today, so a bit of an introduction. Um, we've been running these sessions now for, well, several months, um, certainly since lockdown began. Um, and an explanation of what COMMIT is. Um, well, COMMIT initially was, uh, was formed as a, as a collaboration platform uh, to bring together owners, contractors, vendors um, and academia. We have a long history of running um, Product productivity projects with our members uh, that have often gone on to form businesses in their own right, um, which are capable of delivering huge value to industry. Comet itself was, was a project back in 2003 when the TSB, which we now know as Innovate UK, uh, was formed and so was Commit. Um, recently, and in conjunction with a long supporting Commit member, EMS, we recently bid for and won an award to develop a solution for the COVID tracking. Um, we're currently working on the finer detail of that and we'll enter into rollout very shortly. Uh, so, Commit to Collaboration Platform brings everybody together. Um, we've been running the webinars, I say, for several months. We've had some very interesting subjects, topics, uh, always with, with fantastic company and industry experts, and today is absolutely no ex exception. So, thanks, guys, for joining us. Um, I want to just talk about... Um, just bear with me a second, I've got a, a slide freeze. Um, I want to talk about the Q&A. You will have an opportunity all the way through to either raise your hand, type a question in the box. We thrive on questions. Um, we're looking forward to getting your questions in. We've had a few questions already, so I'll add those to the list. I may mix and jumble them, but uh, please keep the questions coming in. A little bit about Commit's um, productivity drive. Um, the Commit community, um, as I say, is, is, a, is a collaborative platform. And what I would say is behind all technologi technological initiatives in our industry is a simple goal, and that is improving productivity. Often the best improvements come from a combination of knowledge, the people, the process, and the technology. Uh, the Commit community has identified with the major barriers facing our industry and has developed an opportunity with its members to create enablers with the potential for huge beneficial change that would lead to cross industry improvement and essentially what we call the fingerprint for success. This initiative we, we call the Commit to Productivity Initiative, C2P, will bring together owners, contractors, academics and solution providers to collaborate and seek new ways of enablement through process improvement and ultimate demonstration projects. The aim is to reduce uh, capital projects cost by up to 30% and a reduction of cycle times by up to 10%. Okay, um, the areas that we're going to talk about today, as you can see, is highlighted on the right hand side. But of course, this doesn't just work in that little particular area, it cuts across several areas. And these are the areas that we've worked on so far. And we've got many more to follow. Um, okay, at this juncture, in our sessions each week, um, we have a series of poll questions. Now, occasionally we don't have any curveballs, but today we have. And I'll bring up the first one, if I may. Now, they're multi-choice. Um, we have several more this week than we had last time. But 
please bear with me and answer as as you feel as you feel free well, as you as you wish um so the first question i've got for you it's friday you've had a busy week you've enough of people talking through meeting software with the mics on mute how do you unwind let me launch that for you oh, well so, have you got an alcoholic beverage <laughs> Well, yes, one or two have. I can see that already. Um, family games night, film night. You get yourself a nice takeaway. Or I'll turn on the laptop and continue writing some work, writing some thesis. On a Friday night. <laughs> Ian, it happens. <laughs> ah, yes. I suppose students haven't written anything or, or done any work during the rest of the week, so I suppose they've got to do something during the evening. <laughs> I'll just give that a second or two longer. Thanks very much for your answers. Okay, let me share that. So, what's everybody's thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't think anybody uh, is, is um, yes. <laughs> interesting that people don't watch films on a on a on a friday night hmm it is isn't it anyway okay so thank you for that next question do you have have you purchased flat pack furniture can you see that one who who hasn't who i just who hasn't really <laughs> Yeah, and, and okay. you always have one part left over once you've built it. There you go. And I also have a okay. drawer of those little um, um, Allen keys. They come with it. 80%, 86% of the audience have them as well, Ian. Look. Mm. Uh, always very useful afterwards. Okay. Fabulous. Next question. What's your perception experience of flat pack furniture? Select all that apply. Okay. So, okay. It's cheap, full quality. It's good for logistic considerations. It offers me an instant solution, low lead time. It's quality and value for money. Wow. Well, I think with anything, you get what you pay for. Um, being a, a, a Yes, you can buy some pretty, pretty poor flat pack furniture, um, but at the same time you can buy some pretty expensive stuff. Um, I'm going to say the the, the real um, key about a lot of this is I would never have got this big office desk that I've got in my office uh, in this office without it being flat pack. Yeah. So some good answers there. I'm um, not sure about those percentages, but um, yeah, interesting. Mm. Thanks for your answers on that one. Okay, next one. Would you consider a factory built house for your next home? So we've got three answers there. Yes, no, not sure. Yeah. I think I probably would actually. I, I would personally, I would, if it was given as an option, I would do it over some of the appallingly badly built houses that I see building up around me at the moment. Uh, the village I live in is no longer a village I live in. It's gone from 4,000 houses um, back 20 years ago, and it's probably around about 25,000 houses, I'd have thought now. And they're sticking another 4,000 on the bottom end. In fact, they're going to create a brand new village only about three miles away um, with no new schools, hospitals, playing fields, uh, train stations, infrastructure, um, and the quality is pretty bad. Um, but if I was going to buy another house, I think factory built would go every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks everybody for that one. And next one we've got here is. What's your main driver when buying a house? 
Price, size, appearance style, individualism, construction method, or the area and views. Um, unfortunately, I mean, you know, much that it shouldn't really be the, the, the case. I think most of the time it is the price. You've, you've got a budget. Yeah. And you've got to stick to it. Um, yeah. If the construction method is good, and perhaps you know something in there might be the sustainability um, and the ecology uh, of the, the house and the fact that it's you know, sourced from environmentally friendly materials um, and promises to be a much lower carbon um, content, but then we're all driven by what we can afford. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Well, thanks everybody for that one. Um, let me share it. Okay. Yeah. Area. And the last one, if we can get autonomous technology to help us carry out jobs quicker, safer, and to a higher standard, should it be invested in? Carry out our jobs quicker, safer, and to a higher standard. Yeah. <sighs> People will always find another way of, of uh, another job to do. Uh, and if we can get them out of the dangerous environments, then all the better. You know, back in the Victorian era, um, you know, things like mining and, and sweeping chimneys and things like that, they would send the, the, the kids up there at that moment in time. Yeah. That's what happens. Yet they, they got autonomous technology to do a lot of that. Um, and, uh, you know, and we employed kids doing other things like going to school yeah 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 okay let me uh let me share the results of that 88 percent yes yes hell yes but this is a question i've had a few times what are the people going to do um mm. well if you take bricklayers for example you can't get them and scaffolders they're a struggle to get hold of too um anyway there we are so thank you very much for participating in that that's uh, that's brilliant. Um, I will now go on to the next slide, if I may, and I want to just talk about the um, the, the the subject today. And okay, so whilst we've heard about DFMA, we've talked a few th <laughs> around a few things there already. Um, it's not a new concept, um, but it's become more and more of a talking point. And certainly from an infrastructure point of view, elements are being considered. Uh, for fabrication away from site and hauled in. Uh, the advantages are there, well, hopefully by the end of this session, you'll see the advantages, they're there to see. Um, but let me not steal anybody's thunder, yeah? Wait for the session. Um, so just to get back to the title, um, elements within the capital project world could be transformed for the use of off-site manufacturing. If we take housing as an example, the target set by the government in 2015, which was one and a half million, uh, the one and a half million house strategy, has not been achieved. Um, the benefits of DFMA linked with the advantages of autonomous assembly lines have been widely published. If these advantages are correct, why is the uptake so low? <clears throat> is there a chicken and egg scenario? You need to use, do you need to use DFMA to increase um, or to gain capital investment? You need investment to enable greater output, wider use. Where are we heading? So thanks very much for everybody joining in today. And I'm now going to pass you over once I've introduced everybody to the experts. So it looks like we've got a problem getting Christy in, Stuart. Um, have we? So I have to skip over her at first and then come yeah. back to her shortly. Right. OK, so I'm going to go straight on to Matthew. Um, Matthew Coppin is a warrant officer serving in the British Army with the Royal Engineers. Matthew started in, in the construction industry as a plant operator developing into a project manager. Matthew has 18 years service, uh, delivering various projects around the globe in challenging environments and situations. Currently, Matthew sits in, in the trials and development space, exploring new technology and how the Royal Engineers can best explore it. Matthew is nearing completion of his MSc in construction management, which is focusing his, the his thesis on DFMA in the housing sector. Following on from that, we've got David Phil. Um, David's an early adopter of practical change and purposeful collaboration. David is a chartered construction manager by background and impact director. Um, 
as digital, at, at, well, sorry, impact director at the Construction Innovation Hub. David has been involved in delivering innovative BIM and digital asset management strategies across the globe from Singapore, UK, Australia, and the Baltics. David was seconded into UK Cabinet Office in 2011 as head of BIM implementation and subsequently the Scottish Future Trust as chair of the Scottish BIM Delivery Group. He is a trustee of the Charity Institute of Building, where he is chair of the policy board. Additionally, David is vice chair of the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. A fellow of the ICE, RICS and CIOB, he has completed the virtual design and construct at Stanford University, California, and is a visiting professor at Middlesex University. Next up, we've got Malcolm Taylor. Malcolm is a chartered engineer and a specialist in dig digital, digitization for Crossrail International and focused on the creation and implementation of project information management on major projects to drive better outcomes for complex infrastructure programs. With over 40 years of experience in program and project management, design and construction on major transport infrastructure schemes, Malcolm is a leading exponent of the UK's drive for digital maturity in client organisations. <clears throat> Currently part of the UK BIM Alliance and a supporter of UK BIM task groups, he has appeared in the UK media as a transportation specialist, notably on Sky News, BBC News 24 and BBC Radio 4. As head of technical information for 10 years at Crossrail, Malcolm's responsibilities include development of technical digital technical information strategies, as well as BIM, CAD, uh, CAD services, document management, geographic information systems, and asset information management. He's also helped manage Crossrail's award-winning Innovate UK program, sorry, Innovate 18 program. In 2013, 2015, he won the British Construction Industry Award for BIM project application, and also in 2015, a Fiatech Star Award. And then finally, we've got Sarah. Um, Sarah is a senior consultant at HKA, a leading dispute avoidance and resolution firm. Sarah specializes in BIM and 4D for dispute avoidance and resolution. So thanks very much to our uh, team of experts, our panelists. I will now lead in. Now, Christine, I don't think Christine's gonna join us. So just bear with me a second. I'm just gonna go to the uh, next session which is Matt, and okay, Matt, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart and Ian, for the introductions. Um, classing me as an expert, I'm probably a pigeon flying with eagles at the minute, as I'm, as I'm still in the military looking at branching out towards a construction injury at some point. Um, as it's already been said then, looking at um, design for manufacturing assembly and autonomous technology and looking at how I can uh, link the two together to bring uh, the housing targets set by the government within arm's reach. Uh, next slide, please. So, as I said, oh, back one, please, if we can. Sorry. That's all right. Um, so, currently, a warrant officer serving with the Royal Engineers, uh, studying an MSc in construction management. And my DFMA experience. Uh, I've had a number of tasks, but the majority of, of where I've used it was in South Sudan building a hospital. Uh, quite a challenging project in a, in a very austere environment uh, with pretty much the odds stacked against you with the logistics chain uh, and politics within the country. So I, I'm using this webinar then as, as a way of, as a, of, of accessing the, the experts that you see on the panel alongside me to gain industry expert opinion and, and realities, because it's okay looking in textbooks and reading articles, but it's sometimes best to actually engage with, with industry. So this webinar, uh, when it becomes open source, uh, I'll be using as a research method. Um, if anyone's got any issues with, uh, with that, please get in touch with me. Um, I'll never name anyone in person, it'll always just be like an alphanumeric um, designation, but please just, just let me know if you've got any concerns. Next slide, please. So, so as it was said then, uh, in, the, in the Conservatives um, manifesto, they set out to set uh, 200,000 homes a year uh, as a target. Uh, it's eventually now slipped to 300,000 homes a year. Um, and at the point now, 2019, we've had an 11 year high hitting 170,000 uh, new homes. Uh, now these figures change depending on where you, where you look at, um, especially for the, uh, the homes that have been constructed a year. 
but even looking at that 170,000, we're not even hitting the 200,000 a year um, that we were, were trying to hit into, uh, in 2015. Next slide, please. So for anyone who's not sure, um, as when you when you talk about design for manufacturing and assembly or off-site construction, modern methods of construction, it all gets quite confusing. Um, the, uh, effectively, what we're looking at is uh, construction components that are built in factory environments, so away from a, uh, the site where they can be controlled in environments, be that the actual weather environment or the um, safety environments uh, with the look of then transporting to site and either in an assembly or constructing on site to create that finished product. Next slide please. So looking through um, various articles, books, um, other webinars and uh, podcasts, there's a number of different um, benefits that that come out for um, design for manufacture. The um, one of the one of the ones is reduced project costs. I've, I've put circa thirteen percent on there. Again, depending where you read, I've seen thirty three percent recorded. Um, and again, the reduced project duration fifty to seventy percent there. That's quite a high end figure. Um, I have seen that reported, but generally they're quite a bit lower. Again, thirty to forty percent in time savings. I think some of the key ones there um, that aren't often um, reported on our allows a more diverse um, workforce. I uh, listened to a podcast the other day, someone pointed out that how many times on a construction site do you see somebody in a wheelchair or with disabilities that are able to um, interact on the construction site safely? If you move this away and put it into a factory environment, there's more chance of this happening. It can be controlled better. <laughs> Excuse me. And I think one of the key ones as well is the reduced snagging and improved quality. Um, by keeping it in a factory, if there are any uh, defects or, um, or areas need improving, they can be controlled before they even leave the factory, so they never get to site, uh, potentially with the defects. Uh, so there's just a, a few points there. There's, there's definitely more benefits out there, but these are just a few of uh, highlighted. Next slide, please. Okay, so... Obviously, with everything, there's limitation and barriers uh, and risks associated. Um, these are quite widely reported. Um, one one that's often is, is reported is, is repetition required to get the maximum. So when you're thinking along the lines of hotel construction, care homes, where those uh, rooms or the the final product has a has a number of areas that are just repeated over and over, you can then mass produce these products just to be assembled on site and and positioned. One that I've put in red at the top there, the, the lack of individuality, which is, is sort of linked to perception, is, is people have this prefab idea in their head that we're talking post-war prefabrication, where it, it's really bad quality, it's quick off the uh, factory line, and, and it's just not meeting what the uh, consumer wants. The, the lack of individuality, I, I looked around the, the estate that I live on, and so the estate I live on is six years old, it's, um, had four developers uh, working on the site and when you look around there's probably 24 different houses out of 700 so when people are saying there's a lack of individuality I'd, I'd say that unless you're bespoke building your home there's a lack of individuality anyway we're, we're living in an environment where it's just repetitive they just now move the, the different plots around so that these houses aren't right next to each other next slide please So my way of thinking is that we these factory environments need to adopt a um, assembly line similar to, to what Fordism did many years ago with that hope of increasing productivity, reducing the product cost. But the problem is we need that capital investment to make this happen. We are seeing things uh, happen like with um, Ilka Homes now and the government investing 30 million to try and uh, boost up the factories. Um, and you're seeing it over in um, Japan as well with Sekisui and their various different um, brand names. They've even started putting the robots in there now to create the homes. Um, so somewhere now that I'm looking at that, trying to find out why this isn't happening or if it is, why it's so slow in the UK. Next slide, please. All I did here was just create a quick, um, very crude comparison of, you know, people often try and compare the car and the house industry on how we can go down this route. 
um, people tend to think that with a car that there's there's thousands and thousands of different combinations that you can have, but they're soon whittled down once you get to manufacture and model. It then starts becoming very much um, almost like superficial changes then that that create the the unique car. And it's the same with the house. Um, as you can see there, once once you go to the house builder and house type, you are starting whittling it down where you, you then become um, uh, it's just small changes then which change how your house is actually built. Next slide, please. So in 2018, um, Parliament uh, discussed it and said that there was 15,000 uh, new homes that were built with modern methods of construction. So we're not even breaking it down yet really into DFMA. Um, that's 5% of the 300,000 target that they're aiming to hit. So we're still way off the mark and there's still a great potential uh, to push this forward. Next slide, please. So as, as it was mentioned there about the chicken and the egg scenario, uh, and I, I was trying to trying to get my head around how how we're going to move this forward and how the industry is going to is going to up the the DFMA um, levels of of con construction in the factories. Next slide, please. And I, and I think there's a problem where we've, we're stuck where we need that capital investment to be able to have a demand increase, but you need a demand increase to demand that capital investment. And the key thing I think with this industry is we've had a 300,000 home target. Now that doesn't mean that all homes are going to be created this way, but you've got a bit of a unique setting where you know the target that you're trying to hit. Um, but you know, at a government level, what they want you, to, what, what they want to try and achieve. So that the demand figures are, are sort of being being put in place, but it's now a time to find out how that capital investment is going to come about. And now we are seeing it with the government, uh, like I said, investing in Ilka homes, but this problem of the chicken and egg scenario seems to still be uh, prevalent. So that's where I'm looking at it from, uh, and I'll hopefully be uh, putting some, some questions to the, to the panellists to try and uh, see their take on this, both for the housing sector and for more in the commercial as well. I think that should be my last slide. There okay, Matt, thank you. Um, so just bear with me a second. I'm going to now see if we can get Christine in. Um. Oh, we are indeed. So uh, through the power of technology, um, I don't know whether you can see this, but this iPhone here has Christine on it in FaceTime, who's looking at my camera, who's looking at us, who's going to be talking through my phone, hopefully being picked up by that, because for some reason, um, well, yes. Go to meeting is not accepting that at the moment. So, um, <laughs> crossed. I'll get Christine to speak very, very loudly, but um, and to say when the next slide needs to come up. Um, but hopefully, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Stuart. Um, apologies to the listeners in terms of um, being slightly out of the planned order today. So. If you can go to the second and third slide in the code, please. Is that slide, slide, yeah, slide two? That's okay. Slide two, and basically, they were the questions that you posed to us as panelists. Our slide three are some generic graphics, particular to um, the simple methods of construction. I didn't catch all the previous speaker, but I have no doubt some of these were referenced by he. And if you could go to slide four, the generic question I wanted to beg in the first instance is what do we mean by DFMA? I mean, obviously, know what that acronym means, designed for manufacture and assembly. However, I come across copious clients. Who say yes, we want to we want to incorporate the FMA, or they use the acronym MMT, Modern Methods of Construction. And my immediate question back to the questions I'm posing right now. So what do, what do they mean, or what do they actually think the FMA references? Are they talking about products designed for off-site manufacture and assembly? Which is subsequently delivered to site as an entity? Are they talking about products designed for off, off site manufacture? However, latter 
facilities assembled on site are then to provide an entity. They simply mean that, and this is what a lot of clients they come across think they mean, that they simply mean toilet pods, bathroom pods intended for student and hotel accommodation, repeated across floor plates, repeated across floors quite, quite literally. Or do they sometimes mean preformed roof trusses, precast concrete, insulated panels for interior use, or external cladding? Or another take, do they mean platform design and or digital construction? Do they actually mean modern methods of construction? And I perceive there's a muddle out there. Some of some of the suggested modes, those modern methods of construction, are not specifically modern and have been effectively around for numerous years, if not decades. They've been part of what we actually perceive as traditional methodologies across recent decades. So we also categorise the FMA or modern methods largely from a physical perspective. And my take again is slightly wider than that. However, at present we have numerous tier one contractors and major clients adopting these strategies both worldwide and more local to home. So if you just in slow time go through the next four slides, they're just some graphics of MMC or DFMA, dependent on your take, both internationally and more locally. So I've just got some visuals to share with you. So we've got New York. The next slide is much more local to home in Croydon. And some more examples in Creekside Greenwich, undertaken by Elements Europe. And the same, same provider um, on the next slide has been involved in a, a substantive number of projects in Manchester. If you go to the next slide, you've simply got a graphic that references time, cost and quality. And I think our previous speaker referenced Mark Farmer, as always, he references modern methods of construction Terming these as saviour of our industry, whether we're talking DFMA or MMC, we should modernise or die. If we don't, if we if we don't modernise, subsequently our industry will die. I'm not quite so on board with that overt statement. However, we largely use these generic terms to reference new and innovative perspectives. Particular to the delivery of assets, also applicable to all stages of project delivery. Specific to quality, we assume we make that assumption the better the production and the product, the more likely the efficiency of the asset. However, my suggestion is that we need a little better clarity, and clarity is core to success and thus adoption. To revisit some of my earlier words, if we have clients who understand what they're asking for relative to DFMA or modern methods of construction, potentially that will lead to greater success. If you go to the next slide, please. And my other take is this is particular to success, is very much particular to change. That adaptation use of DFMA or again modern methods of construction, it's part of a change in our perception as an industry, but again fundamental to the client's change of perception. To state the obvious, if we're going to facilitate change, any concept needs to provide financial advantage. There must be a financial advantage to persuade that change. Change needs to be easy to undertake and easy to understand. Provide a social benefit, the work on the screen, and must be fit for purpose. It also must be bespoke for that particular client body to come on board. And again, reference all types of change. Concept of change needs to be the words at the bottom popular, desirable, 
reaping rewards and must become a habit. So, again, my suggestion is if we're talking the FMA or MMC in terms of future benefits, this effectively must become part of our best practice. If you go to the next slide, please. I also perceive any change is not just about the process, not simply about the materials, but it's about people. And to be successful, these methodologies are also dependent upon people, teams which are both diverse and collaborative, teams which, with these new methodologies, some of which, as I've stated, are existing methodologies, they need to be flexible and adaptable to provide those flexible and adaptable solutions. Innovation and the management of change combined with clarity, in my, or from my perspective, are integral to success. If you go to my next slide, what I've put on the next slide is a whole host of what I perceive are modern methods relative to construction out with of just literally the FMA. And part of pursuing change, part of persuading clients that we should be using modern methodologies, I think there are several signs integral to MMC. And perhaps it's maybe it's baby steps, maybe it's easy steps. But maybe some of these methodologies are ways of, in the first instance, selling to a client, a potential client, the potential for that wider perspective of modern methods of construction. And my final slide is simply relative to success that modern methods and modern teams lead to modern and smart assets. However, Clarity and change management, and this is my perspective, are fundamental to that success. So, effectively, that concludes my generic perspective, and I look forward to hearing the views of others. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Ian. Um, just bear with me a second. I'm just going to now. Thanks, Ian. That worked. That worked well from where I sat. I could hear her pretty clearly. Um, okay, I'm. I'm going to now bring in David. Um, okay. One second. Okay, David, over to you. Hi, Stuart. Hi, Ian, and hi everyone from from Scotland. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I think Ian is it's not my first uh, Comet rodeo, so I, it was nice to actually make a bit of an effort today and uh, and get dressed up. And just go back to your first question, Ian, if you are doing flat, flat pack furniture, I would recommend one of these wonderful tools as well, which uh, is fantastic for DFMA. So really nice to be here today and uh, talk about our work from the Construction Innovation Hub and how that fits in very much from a DFMA uh, perspective on there. So next slide, please, Stuart. So who am I? I don't want to dwell on it too long. Sure, it gave a, a, a fantastic overview sort of thing. So I'm Impact Director at the Construction Innovation Hub. I've been within our built environment for over 25 years, and I think it's probably the last 10 years I've seen a real profound change. I saw a huge amount of digitization. I saw a huge amount of modern method construction, and increasingly starting to think about real-time data from digital twinning, from sensors and analytics. And I think it's fair to say that Cricky, you could go back to what the Simons report in 1940, we talked about the FMA, you know, why we never done it. Well, I think we're starting to see several things happening now. I think we're starting to see a real pull from clients starting to ask for it. But I think the big thing is we're now starting to see a convergence of themes between digital uh, in terms of manufacturing and uh, all these concepts coming together. I think that's a huge importance as we go forward. Next slide, please, sure. Thank you. So, so I mentioned, I think it's worth giving just a quick overview. I talk about Construction Innovation Hub or the Hub. And essentially, the Hub brings together world class expertise from three centres the Manufacturing Technology Centre, MTC, Building Research Establishment, and the Centre for Digital Built Britain at Cambridge University. And we're aiming to transform the UK construction industry. And you can see within the slide there, you know, we work around four key themes, and this is where we talk about convergence. So it's not just thinking about DFMA in isolation, but how do we bring value? 
manufacturing, how do we make sure we're assuring it and digitization within there? So we try to change the way that we build both our buildings and infrastructure, how they're planned, designed, manufactured, but also how they're integrated and connected within that world of our built environment. We think we're catalysts for change and we're, we're driving collaboration to develop and promote both digital and manufacturing technologies. And one of the things we think by doing this, we're helping build smarter, greener, and more efficient built environments. And I think, you know, as we're all in different positions today, probably it's never been so important to be future wise and plan not just for now, but actually plan to change tomorrow and how we can start to make well informed choices that are going to last. So, Stuart, next slide. So, you can see within there, uh, in terms of you know, what we're trying to achieve, we believe that over the next decade, the world of traditional construction will increasingly give way to high quality, and we call it PDFMA, platform based manufacturing solutions. And Hub is working with government clients, we talk about the pool, who will lead that way in terms of rationalising and digitising the requirements and adoption of principles of whole life value within their. <coughs> excuse me. And under the industrial strategy, a transformational tech solution for the construction sector, we believe is achievable. And one of these uses what we call platform-based manufacturer solutions that exploit the power of data and technology as part of a new dynamic digital framework and actually improve performance and value across the whole life cycle. So you can see there, in terms of the system we're promoting, a platform construction system, we are trying to promote, uh, sorry, I think you jumped ahead there, sure, within there. We believe that you know we can reduce cost, delivery time, but also thinking about improving carbon emissions and also how we increase that whole asset life cycle as well, which is hugely important for us as well. So you move on. Thank you. So we're working with Insight to identify and co-develop a digitally enabled platform solution that can be designed, manufactured, installed, very much in a structural carrier system as well within there. And this builds upon, you can see the IPA's call for evidence starting to move towards our platform design for manufacture within there. And we're working and co-developing that with industrial partners to create a new integrated, digital enabled manufacturing components and sub-assemblies. You can see them within there as well, but they'll also be supplemented uh, with new interface standards as well, which will establish clear rules for how components will come together. And we're working with industry to make sure that happens. And the big thing is these standards will be available to all businesses in the UK, removing barriers especially for SMEs and new entrants. And one of the big things is we're going to, it will result in a proof of concept demonstrator and that allows us to, to share the learning and allow further system development as well within there, which is hugely important. You move on again, Stuart. So as you mentioned, you know, we're working with things to identify and co-develop, but you can start to see how it starts to come together. It's going to be designed, manufactured, installed in a structural carrier frame. And you can see one of the big things that can be used across multiple building types from schools, offices, apartment, and many different use cases as well within there. And again, if we start to think about how manufacture comes together with construction, I think compared with traditional construction, the data requirements for a platform construction system are much more front loaded. They're fixed and they can start to improve process and efficiencies in terms of quality of information and how we exchange them right through that life cycle within there. And for us, this is made possible through we're creating a suite of digital tools, a platform construction system, digital wrapper, which includes digital routes to compliance as well. So if you move on one more, sure. One of the big things we're doing, and I would recommend if you come on the Construction Innovation Hub website, one of the things we've created is a construction quality planning process uh, within there, and it's a guide for construction. As you can see from the slide, uh, the CQP is a five-phase process that encourages concurrent engineering, very much from, you know, from that world of cradle to launch. And we're not looking to reinvent the wheel. We've taken the advanced product quality planning, or the APQP, something that's already tried and tested in the manufacturing, and introducing that to the world of, of construction and using it to, for complex products and markets within there as well. And you can see that five phase that we're using within there to try and influence the platform construction system within there. And that shows us the required inputs, the activities, the outputs, the deliverables and the milestone for each phase. It provides background and the tools that are going to be used to achieve these deliverables. And it starts to give us a breakdown of the gated approval process that represents the transitions between the phase as we start to create these new products 
and concepts as well. So we move on again one more. Well, how does this fit with the world of digital? You can start to see that we're starting to use it in terms of all with a common data environment. But we're in the process just now using model offering tools to create parametric assemblies, sub-assemblies there, digital prototyping with rapid feedback loops. We're then starting to think about exchanging it to using an analysis and simulation testing for constructability, maintainability, looking at CFD, but also failure mode at uh, effects analysis with there as well. So creating that iteration, but ultimately we're trying to see the component library, a kit of parts within there. So you can imagine we create, if you like, a set of parametric kit of parts and simulating their performance as well within there. We can start to use for a physical advanced manufacturer. Move on one more. And we're lucky enough that as well, this really interfaces with our digital framework. You know, our digital and applied technologies can help us think about PDFMA and use these models to understand the parameters of sustainable operation and how we can actually start to think about optimizing whole life CO2 outcomes and transform what we're building as well within there. Just click on one more of the transition. And we're lucky enough that when we think about building this, when we think about the information and data for modern methods and platforms within there, we believe that the first step should be very much to accelerate the uptake and embedding, if you like, of tools and processes, especially those that we've co-developed with industry. And the one that I would highlight is the UK BIM framework within there. Please, if you haven't, go into the UK BIM framework. That gives us a real important foundation for information management and secure exchange of information as well within there. Click on one more. And we're also starting to think about the world of, you know, if you like, connection, digital twinning. How do, if we are going to collect, you know, create things that are rapidly with an advanced manufacturer and MMC, how can we connect it? How can we benchmark? How can we share data to think more and more about the performance of our assets as we go as well? Next one, please, Stuart. But one of the big things that we think is hugely important as well is, you know, if we're going to be really serious about, you know, changing construction fit for the future, the first thing we must get into grips for is starting to think about value. And we're working alongside some of the leading minds of industry to create the development of a new value framework that sets out to tackle the key challenges about what we should be valuing, what we should be measuring, and how what we should be using to make decisions. You can see within there, our toolkit has got three key modules of value definition, client and market approach, but also thinking about evaluation and measurement within there as well, which is hugely important. So click on one more, please. So you can see that we think as we create, thinking about creating buildings that are gonna be fit for the future, we believe it's about creating a higher quality outcome, safer in creation, but in also operation. We need to use data and digital solutions to make sure that we're optimizing performance, especially for, if you like, the society and end users. And at the same time, we've got to do this within that envelope of less energy, create less waste and less carbon, but also use this as a great opportunity to attract new people to a sector, be seen as modern, diverse, and attract new talent within there. And need support UK business to innovate, thrive, grow, and take up MMC and PDFMA solutions as well there. So if you move to just the very final one. Yeah. You can do it, Stuart. Have I gone so, too thank you, Dustin. And we really believe that digital is going to be key to support and better outcomes, especially when you converge it with manufacturing, safer, better performing, more sustainable. And thank you for listening. Thanks, David. That's superb. Um, okay, um, we've got lots of questions developing. Um, okay, so. Next one, I'm going to go to Malcolm. Malcolm, are you um, are you there? Yep. Can you turn your camera on. There we are. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Fantastic. Loud and clear. Great. It's all it's all yours. Okay, Stuart and Ian. Many thanks for inviting me here today. It's uh, it's a real pleasure. I'm just going to be quite quick. I've got a few slides, which is really DFMA. Uh, that have been applied to uh, some of the Crossrail uh, projects um, as Head of Technical Information at Crossrail for over 10 years. Uh, the Custom House project particularly interested me because of its dependency on DFMA and the linkage with the world of BIM and 3D modelling and the like. So um, 
the Custom House site, it's you know, about 250, 300 metres long. You can see the Custom House platform there. It's constrained by the a very busy road, Victoria Bock Dot Road on one side and DLR on the other. And basically, um, it is an assembly, a kit of parts. Oh, I lost your mic. Malcolm. Please. Malcolm. Okay, go on. Yep. Next slide, please. Yep. Um, yep. And you can see there from the architectural design, in simple terms, it's basically a long plinth with a capped colonnade. And on at platform level, if you looked up, you'd see a sort of vaulted roof panels. Uh, next slide. The, from an engineering perspective, um, it really is, uh, you can see if you uh, click, uh, just one click there please, you can see basically you've got an A-frame uh, resisting a lot of the wind load from one side and the colonnade would resist the other. That's sitting on a, that's all precast, all sitting on an in situ uh, set of foundations, uh, pretty poor ground, so all of that had to be uh, in situ. Um, if you go to the next slide, the interesting thing here, I think, when you start to think about um, DFMA and the individual components, all of this kit of parts as it comes together, you've got quite specific types of connections that need to come together um, that are often going to be bespoke. Different contractors, suppliers will try different, or have different methods of joining all these things together. So as a client, you've got to be mindful for that. And therefore, there's a lot more design work that needs to be done by the by the contractor. 3D model is in, it's imperative that you um, that you share and work with the contract from a client perspective that you work with the uh, contractor who's putting all this together so that you can get this kit of parts to fit um, because of the types of constraints. Contractor came up with a terrific idea for using a gantry crane because this is just a long thin site and that crane um, did uh, did all the work to, um, uh, and was amazingly, amazingly clever. Contractor also used the uh, QR codes on the components for, for tracking and quality control and all sorts of things on that. Um, next slide. Uh, yeah, if you begin to see it, in fact, you can see there, it's quite an interesting um, uh, roof there, a plastic bubble type roof supported on uh, aluminium and steel frames, a lot of uh, the um, platform screen doors, everything there you can see how that bit of that uh, kit of parts comes together. And I think really interesting for me is that the benefits that came out of this weren't just the, uh, the cost benefits, it's about the minimizing the work on site. Um, interestingly enough, the uh, local impacts were significantly reduced by the, this off-site manufacturing process. Um, it meant that the, uh, which in turn meant, um, in terms of driving down the program, uh, at time meant prelims were reduced. Interestingly enough, much of the ac build activity that was done at the contractor's factory was done during the Olympic blockade back in 2012. And so there were fewer deliveries, fewer movements on site. Um, so uh, lots and lots of benefits there. Um, just quickly onto the next slide. If you can, yeah, it wasn't just at the custom house station. That also one of the uh, one of the underground mine stations. The um, same off-site manufacturing process was used for constructing the what are effectively the platform boxes. And uh, ev evidence-based, you can see that compared to the all, all the other um, three or four sites that had the in situ construction. The precast, uh, 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 precast off-site manufacturing solution that had significant improvements in productivity, not just in terms of quality and in terms of health and safety. So that was, uh, again, I think some very good evidence there. Um, next slide. So my own views really, um, if you just first click, one click please. Uh, yeah, the sorts of issues that uh, come up all, always that we see, things about the you know, intellectual property for these different types of systems that different contractors have, 
One of the problems, of course, is that contractors need to invest in these types of plants uh, for this construct off-site manufacturing, and that in turn, you know, gives quite significant fixed costs that need to be paid for and can't be turned off quite so easily as contractors can with their uh, subconsultants when uh, subcontractors when they're wanting to uh, build in conventional terms. So there's issues there about uh, contractors wanting to do this when they know they've got a supply of work that can help pay for those fixed costs. And you know, from client perspective, you know, I don't I don't see any real consistent procurement models for this. And next click. Um, but there's no doubt the supply chain could do this. Uh, you can see it in uh, examples, not just in the sort of interest, seen it in the building side from the other speakers. You can have seen it in uh, construction on infrastructure, you know, clearly a major bridge, construction bridges and the like, but you do see it in stations. Um, next click, please. I think clients are one of the key issues here about trying to drive up the uh, uh, interest and make DFMA happen more because, um, you know, the uh, uh, clients have got to be actively and positively engaged in the way in which they procure. You know, you do need to, as Crossrail uh, did, you do need to get early contractor uh, involvement, uh, optimize that. So it gives the contractor then time to basically look at the uh, designs, the design requirements, and see how they can uh, they can use uh, DFMA, how they can get that to work. Um, and you know, for me particularly, when it comes to stations and the amount of back of house type of uh, stuff that you have, one of the regrets I have in Crossrail is that you you know each of those stations behind uh, in back of house is almost completely different. There's huge amounts of standardization and off-site work uh, that could be done to improve the actual fit-outs of stations. And that final point I've got there is really that, you know, clients, we tend to just follow the rules that uh, we, you know, we're, we're given in terms of business, making business cases for these types of uh, infrastructure that we uh, we create. So you do need to have some of these rules and guidelines set, you know, business cases need to be able to bring into into things like best value and things like David's toolkit uh, that he talked about. Um, so finally, just a couple more clicks there, if you could. Everything on Crossrail, some of the things I've talked about, it's all in there on a learning legacy website for Crossrail. Uh, and that really is it, for, I think, as far as I'm, for me, Stuart, one more slide is just the last one to say thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. That was superb. Thank you. Slightly overrun there. Sorry. Yeah, well, but, uh, okay. Um, we, we should head straight into the um, into question time. So, um, without further ado, if everybody could turn their cameras back on, um, please. And the first question I've got, if I can, um, Sarah, this one's for you. Um, okay. So. Through the use of DFMA, um, would that lead to a decrease in disputes? I think that's perfect for you, that isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, it's actually one that I come across quite regularly. So often people ask me whether um, BIM or DFMA or whatever new buzzword is going to lead to a decrease in disputes. And the short answer is no. And the evidence in that is that I work with BIM and DFMA in disputes on a fairly regular basis. Um, and it's becoming more and more frequent. So the long story short is that um, basically BIM and DFMA uh, are two pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that are sort of not immune when the puzzle falls off the table and the dispute arises. And they're kind of, um, whilst they might be involved in a dispute, they're never um, the heart of the dispute, they're never the crux of the dispute, it's sort of just um, part of the perennial issues of, say, design change or cash flow issues or under resourcing. Um, and design change is the biggest one I see, which is obviously a difficulty when you fabricated something off site and you now want to implement a change. Um, so one of the biggest disputes we see is around how um, someone wanted to make that change and perhaps the design responsibilities with the subcontractor where they've missed something and uh, the change is required to meet a standard 
or perhaps the design change is completely unrelated to the subcontractor and they're experiencing delay and disruption and, um, and they want an extension of time and uh, cost awarded. Um, so in short, no, DFMA, um, it de definitely do risks uh, things, um, but we're still seeing disputes which involve DFMA. But obviously, if you've designed it right first, in the first place, and you've got that certainty, then you definitely see a reduction, um, but it's not going to eliminate them. Okay, good. I mean, if, if you take it um, in, in isolation, I know it's, it's potentially early days, but if you look at the transactions and, and, and the actions, operations that are reduced, just look at the, the impact on safety. Um, you, you, you could say that you've not got anything like the number of things going on at any one particular time. Um, therefore, your, your ability to, to improve in, in, in respect of safety is great. And, and I would hope in time that um, disputes would be suppressed similarly, if you, if you will. Um, so, okay, next question I've got. Dave, if I can ask you, um, how, is the, how is the Construction Innovation Hub supporting a shift towards advanced manufacture and DFMA? I know you touched on a little bit there, but would you like to expand on that? Yeah, so, so so it's a really good call, question. So we are working, we're responding to, I don't know if everybody has remembered, the IPA's call for evidence on pl platform design for manufacture. So one of the things that was done way back was starting to look at, you know, the different opportunities around about it, especially government uh, clients for repeatability within there as well. So we're in the process just now working with 40 odd industry partners to come up with a solution that can be used for multiple building types and working with departments to look at their needs just now. We're in the process of creating the kit of digital parts within there. We're starting to use all the simulation tools and we'll be in a position soon where we are ready to start to test it and actually build a prototype within there. But one of the things is we're not doing it in isolation and just thinking about PDFMA is how all these different parts of the hub work come together. Now, if we think about you know some of the components you talk about in terms of safety, we're looking as to how it fits with government soft landings, thinking about how we can test for operation within there as well, all the different parts of it. We're thinking about our value and assurance toolkits within there as well. So we're working just now very much to with the part, government departments to try and get come up with something that meets their needs. Now, it's something that, that Matt said early on. You know, we've talked about MMC design for, manu for manufacturers for many years, but why has it never happened? I think there's a term, the bullwhip effect. You know, you start a process, it tapers off. But if we can start to get that pool for government de departments requiring it, suddenly we create, a, if we start to put all those demand profiles together, suddenly you get a consistent pool within there. So for sure. us, it's an opportunity to test manufacture and digital, but also to start to create that demand for government clients as well. Sure, sure. Is there any, any particular country that's leading in this field? Of so is that, yeah, that I, mean, I think I mean, you saw from Christine. I think it, you know, it's, it, it, it's happening. I think all around the world from there. I think you know why are we doing it. I think yeah. we've all got these wicked challenges. I think probably the one of the biggest ones is, is productivity uh, within there as well. I think everybody's trying to you know get better quality of our products as well within there. So we've seen a lot, especially I think Christine had it in her deck, especially in Japan, Canada as well. We've seen a lot of different approaches out in Canada with it there as well. But we're also seeing some great, you know, in the UK, I mean, I live in Scotland, and we're seeing a lot, if you like, of DFMA around about timber solutions as well within there. So I think it's fair to say there's a lot of amazing stuff already happening in the UK. Yeah, okay, great. Well, th thanks for that. Um, I'm gonna to turn to, to Malcolm, if I may. Um, going to the Custom House station, um, I was going past a couple of times on the, um, on the, on the train there and noticed certainly during the erection of that. And I was thinking to myself, is the, um, that, that was a, a, a contractor-led um, yeah. change, if I understand it correctly. Um, yeah. they, they had the facility to, to, to build, fabricate, deliver, and erect. Um, the, the, the encouragement for them to do that was obviously um, time-saving and all the other thing, all the other attributes we've talked about. But, how do we convince other contractors to do the same? I mean, there is opportunity for innovation and value engineering in, in a lot of projects that are released, but how do we 
how do we bring more contractors to say, right, we're not going to do it conventionally with stick bill. We're going to do off-site. We're going to bring it in. We're going to modularize it. We're going to bring it in. We're going to fabricate it on site. How, how do we encourage more of that to happen? Malcolm? Well, I mean, yeah, because you're absolutely right. The original sort of broad concept of that sort of colonnade, that type of long sit um, ar arrangement uh, structurally was, you know, originally thought uh, put put together in a pr for preliminary design purposes and planning as a in situ concrete. And the contractor, as you say, has already got a purpose built facility which he could then re recognise that this was an ideal opportunity, and it was uh, and a great solution. Um, in terms of not just the as a final solution, as a not just final piece of engineering, but in terms of delivery and construction, the, the issue there is how do you get your supply chain to uh, drive these benef the benefits that you can get, like shorter uh, periods on time, uh, better quality, all of those sorts of stuff, um, because it is a problem for those main contractors. Because as some as a contractor as you've got to invest quite significantly in um, plant and equipment to be able to provide the facilities to make DFMA happen. So therefore, um, we can come up with the greatest sort of uh, 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 desire, but if we, don't, if, we, if we don't now start shaping the designs, for example, making sure that, as a, from, again, from a client perspective, you don't go into uh, you don't provide a, a, a very detailed design. You specify your requirements, the type of services, and all the rest of it. Because if, if, if you're going to provide too detailed a design, you are constraining the contractors in what they can do and how they can adapt their manufacturing. So, for example, you know, voids and for services and conduits and things like that. You, the more detail you provide. In, in a design as part of your requirements, the more you're narrowing a contractor's ability to do things. And so I think it also has to start small because if you're a contractor and you don't have these facilities, how are you going to get into the game and compete with the one or two contractors that have this? And I think that's why it is, uh, you know, when you stand back and follow, this is why I'm so interested in the uh, sort of, if you like, the government approach about how we can provide a roadmap that says yes to get contractors into that and your supply chain to have that capability you're either going to have one or two of them do it and corner the market or you're going to have to require and think small get contractors to start building small uh, elements and think of a way in which you can you can gradually bring people in and you and that goes to the point also that you can get out of dfma about the, you know, uh, best value for, uh, out of here, and not just price, and and that's particularly important. Uh, that so, for example, business case rules should now include an assessment for how much offsite manufacturing can be done. Simply put those rules into the into the uh, the guidelines and the books for coming out with business cases, and you will begin to develop the market. If you don't sure. do that, you're going to constrain it terribly. Sure, sure. Can I just ask a question, Lynn, on the back of that? I think, on, um, David, Malcolm, um, I think you, you both mentioned it, but I heard a comment the other day where someone stated that clients aren't actually bothered, whether it's DFMA, whether it's modern, they just want the end product. Now, if the client's not driving it, who's driving it? And if, and if, yeah. Yes. I man, absolutely, and and I think that's the issue about that's the that's the capex-driven solution, which just says you know least cost for um, creating this stuff, um, and and that's why you do need to think to have a um, you do need to have in a business in the business case assessment that all clients have to go through for creating their infrastructure and this stuff. They, they should be having consideration because because sometimes DFMA may, may not be the right uh, solution at our yeah. custom house station clearly you know where you've got tricky stuff underground in situ it's you know it's so I think in there what one is looking for is the best mix and and for me that's the way I would see this gradually opening up is by clients being required being required to you know positively uh, look for uh, DFMA because actually it has got better societal benefits. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, just to lead on from, from that again. Sorry, Stuart. Does it become more complicated then when we're looking at the housing sector where 
your client, you've effectively got a two-tier client system there where you've got your client as in the developer who's buying it off of a modular house builder, for example, and then you've got your house buyer, the other end of it. So you've got to match those needs up through that and they should align really in theory, shouldn't they? But does that then become more complicated where you're, you know, if your end users either one aren't bothered or don't want it, you're just not going to get it, are you? No. You're, you're not you've got that's where <laughs> i think that's where i think that's where i think and, and and it's the government the government guidelines if you like all those rules that we use to make assessments need to force the issue because okay. yeah down at the bottom you you may not be uh, of that supply chain you may not uh you may not be too bothered and and at the very top as a developer you you you're you may not be too worried about some of your sustainability or uh uh, you know, yeah. capex, opex issues. So you have to start putting some of these rules. I would suggest, just like the BIM task group did, and t the mandate to encourage BIM, we do need those sorts of uh, mandates. These these sorts of uh, requirements put in. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. There's two things for me that we're doing just now. I think are hugely important. One is, uh, you know, government soft landings or soft landings generally. I think that's a great way of just getting the end user involved right at the very beginning. You know, when you're going for a business case involvement within there as well to make sure that we're achieving in terms of outcome and performance. So I think you know that's a great tool as well. You know, I also mentioned in my presentation, you know, that the value toolkit we're doing, and I think we need to be thinking about how we procure for value understand what the key drivers are for a project within there as well, and then make a well-informed MMC strategy based upon those requirements. And I think one of the words I always think is proportionality. It's got to be proportionate to the needs that are required as well. I was just going to add in there that, you know, it, it, there's got to be value in there for the housing developer, Matt, purely because when have they ever looked at value for the people in the locality or the people who live in those houses? They never have and they never will. They, they promise a lot. They never deliver. Uh, most of the construction is, is just done purely to make the maximum profit for the housing yeah. developer. So unless we can actually create that uh, point where GFMA, um, that drives up quality and does all the wonderful things that we're talking about, is actually more cost effective for them and drives their profit margins up, then the chances of actually getting anywhere, I think, are pretty slim. That's a good point. Yeah. Is um, yeah. Christine still able to hear us? Yeah. Yeah. One of the things if we get this, sorry, Stuart. Go on, Dave. Go on, carry on. See, one of the things, you know, I think if we do get this right, there's an opportunity for us to change the business model. Yeah. You know, move away from a capital to more a service itation and the sort of outcome driven solution within there. So I think if we combine this with new economic models that is maybe performance and whole life driven, then we've got a real chance within there as well. So I think when we think about innovation, it's about as much for me about changing the business model of what we do is now as well, how we can start to thrive and grow. Thanks, Dave. Um, Dave, can I? I know you touched on it a little bit. Um, can I just ask? Oh, sorry, sorry, and I can see you've got up against the screen now. Um, Christine, um, the 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 challenges of of um, DFMA and and. Um, Combining, what are the challenges with combining DFMA and, and modern methods? I know there was a little bit of discussion on that. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I, I can hear you. I know I'll answer you in a slightly different way because I know the presentations I heard all the way through were amazing and um, the Crossrail presentation. Was. And yeah. I, I absolutely love the value of where I buy it
yesterday of the lake and model. And then I start trying to be a lake a lot of others. I've almost lost the recruitment. I've lost it before I've begun. But that was why my suggestion of that slightly softly softly approach, I think one of the previous um, responders to the question said, maybe, maybe it's we need I, not we, but with some clients need to take a step by step approach. Okay. It's to approach the methods or start approaching the FMA, start talking to ask them what they want, which again is going to be yeah. do they actually know what they want? Okay, Th thanks, Christine. I, I got most of that. Um, if I could just turn to Dave, I've got one question here, which, which um, I know there was a little bit of talk about it. Is synergies between DFMA and and um, and um, digital? Do you want to expand on what you said earlier? Because I, I think that's quite relevant to um, certainly to what what Malcolm was talking about and and Matt earlier. Do, do you want to expand on that? If, if you can. Yeah, I mean, n number one, I mean, one of the big things is, you know, a data framework around about it is if we're going to start building, if you like, you know, a series of digital kits of parts for there, we want to be able to make sure that we've got information that can transfer and make sure that it's repeatable for every every sort of project, creating that golden thread as well with it, right from a business case, right the way through into operation, right into the world of asset management as well within there. We're also thinking about starting to build the rules. So we're thinking about concepts such as BIM and product lifecycle management within there as well, how we can start to think about bringing these concepts together as well. One of the things we want to try and do with this is again, to think about productivity and speed is to try and create configuration tools. So we yeah. start to think about generative design within there. So you can come in and come up with a rule-based solution for it. So if we get the data framework right, we get the tools, we can start to make sure we can do it very, very rapidly with generative design and configurators. We can test it using our assurance-based tools. We can start to think about our product data within there as well. So converging with these two themes, I think is hugely important as well. But it's not just about BIM, it's about BIM. We've got product lifecycle manufacture. We've also got to think about all the sort of simulation type tools as well. Things like, you know, failure mode effect analysis within there. So we can test it as well within there. So there's a huge convergence. And one of the things that we're trying to do at Hub is to, we've got, if you like, the physical construct of the platform construction, but thinking about all the different tools that will support that development within there, especially trying to create a digital marketplace in the future for clients to buy it, but also for the likes of the supply chain to be able to put lead-in times and their solutions within there as well. So I think that's a huge convergence between from my point, not just digital and advanced manufacture, but also between our value and assurance as well within there, which we're building our digital tool sets for. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you for that answer. Um, Malcolm, if I could just turn back to you. Um, you gave a fantastic example there of, um, I think it was, if I remember rightly, Tottenham Court Road and Liverpool Street and the comparison between doing it, if I could use the word conventionally, and <coughs> off-site. Um, fantastic comparison, and, and really, it's it's a no-brainer. Um, if if Crossrail Two comes along, um, the opportunities to do more of the same with offsite would that be well and truly factored in, or would it be left again to the contracting world to say we'd like to? How do you feel about it? I think it's it, it's up to the client. It was up to, in fact. To me, it's up to sort of a, in this in that instance, it would be certainly almost certainly TFL 
to begin to help shape the rules and the requirements at uh, you know at, at tender at tender time because you know the supply chain uh, bluntly the supply chain and contractors will only do what's asked of them you know if you if you if you only require them to do a let's just say a you know an in situ solution that's what you're going to get if you allow them the opportunity and you can give some uh, 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 give, give some wriggle room, give some space in the concepts that you, you come out with for the designs of stations, for example, give room to be able to get some off-site manufacturing and standardization. For me, one of the biggest, I, I still find, struggle a little bit from the very early days in these, these big projects, why, for example, even on the Crossrail scheme that, you know, that we're, we're finishing at the moment, why we don't have much more modularization from the way of uh, uh, the MEP, the Mechanical Electrical Public Health fit out. Yeah. Why don't we get that type of modularization? Because, you know, quite a lot of the, uh, the specific problems that we've had are in terms of uh, station fit out or in the MEP stage. Why can't we treat those like student and housing accommodation, build some of that also the back of house stuff in a modular way and minimize so not just thinking about the, the if you like the concrete and the structural elements but think about the uh, you know all, all of the other sorts of mechanical electrical um, types of equipment as well and i would yeah. hope that type of uh, thing is going to be taken into account in the you know newer railways yeah 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 well thank you for that malcolm um matt i know you had another question or two um so do you want to come in sarah i will come back to you in a second i've got another question for you matt go ahead there's sort of two parts to this and one of them is aimed at sarah is that the, i've read up and i've heard a few comments where people are saying that the lack of uh, interoperability between for example modular systems is something that's locking down the opportunities that could arise so for example company a's product can't fit company b's product if we can unlock that and create a standard sort of iso container that's really really rudimentary i know connection that could unlock it and that could really start really pushing dfma the second part of that question is then goes to sarah is is that just opening a dispute uh situation that you're going to spend more time arguing over over disputes than you are actually constructing anything yeah yeah um that's that's really uh, interesting um so building interoperability um the way around that is setting things up the right way in the first place so actually when you're going through procurement actually making sure that you know things work together and that's not just software it's actual real life assets and materials so say for example if you've got warranties for a particular product with uh one thing then try and keep it consistent um but that, that goes for software as well i mean if someone's using one piece of software that doesn't talk to another that's going to be an issue but that's sort of teasing out over time as technology gets better um yeah i'm not sure if i've answered that question in full um it is that i, th I think yeah i think I, I get what you're saying yeah um i was actually going to make a comment on matt's question i think it was i mean we, i think we've done some client bashing here um especially earlier especially with the housing market and obviously if you ever go onto the bellway or the sim and facebook pages you see a lot of quality disputes and a lot of very unsatisfied customers and you, my heart absolutely goes out to them um but at the same time it's it's quite often not um uh, intentional that these housing uh builders are, are making people miserable it's just a sort of something that sort of just happens um unfortunately and clients want um their projects on time and on budget but i think it's unfair to kind of insinuate that they don't want the quality as well um i think the issue here is that it's to do with design so say for example if we've manufactured something off site and it doesn't have an access panel for example and you're trying to post fix an access panel back on site um that's really just a dis design dispute again because you haven't teased out the design in the early stages and perhaps you haven't had a look from a contractor you haven't had early enough contractor engagement to kind of ask those sensible questions um but that's that's quite often just an easy solution to a massive massive problem um so yeah uh not not to client bash but um yeah i'll, I'll try and talk on their side a little bit 
Well, thanks, Sarah. Sure. Could Sorry, I, can I maybe sorry. pick up as well, just in Matt's one, just there's there's probably two things, Matt, that we're doing with the programme that might be of use. Number one, as I mentioned, that process of construction quality planning, the concurrent engineering piece within there. The CQP planning process is certainly worth a look if you go into the CIH website, because that's starting to look, you know, for those that are thinking about, you know, creating, if you like, manufactured solutions within there, you know, in terms of testing the hold points within there as well, putting that quality within there as well. One of the things we mentioned is, you know, we're trying to create a digital kit of parts. We're going to make sure those parts can come together sort of thing with there. Obviously, we're doing stuff like, you know, the coordination such, but we're trying to create a series of interface standards. So those are the rules, if you like, as to how they come together. And the, the, the idea is, you know, they're going to be something that's open and shareable, that if you are a manufacturer, you, a bit like Cara, you, you know that, you know, these are the, you know, the, the tolerances we've got to work through. These are the key points within there as well sort of thing but i'd say the cqp is certainly worth a look within there yeah definitely thank you very much thanks dave um i've got a hard stop at the top of the hour so i've got a couple of things to finish up with here but i'd like to say firstly thank you to everybody thanks to malcolm to dave to, to matt um to christine sorry christine we couldn't we couldn't see you fully in person but uh, i certainly heard you and um thanks for answering the questions um so thanks very much for, for participating. I thought we'd had some great questions today. Um, I am going to share share the slides, if that's okay with everybody. Um, we've recorded the session and we'll share it afterwards. Um, I'd like to also thank the the sponsors. We've got O2 Business and, and Rebim. Thank you very much to, to both of those. Um, the sessions, there's Christine. Hi, Christine. Um, the sessions are... Um, held on the website. We've got another session coming up on the 27th um, of November, and then we've one more before Christmas after that. Um, the sessions, as I said, are on the website. Um, should be available as soon as I've downloaded the thing. So, so it just remains for me to say thanks very much to everybody for joining. We've had an excellent session. Cheers. I think the competition, David, you oh. win it today. You're a bit more smartly dressed than Ian. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll pay for that later. But thanks very much. <laughs> Cheers. And, um, Keep and everybody, safe, have a, everyone. Keep everybody, safe. Have, everybody have a great weekend. So thank Keep you. Safe. Bye. 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 Cheers now. Thanks, well Bye. done. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.